Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker, and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is Physician Culture's Impact on Payment. Now, this video comes as a response to the recent book reviews that I've done by authors like Dr. Vivian Lee and Dr. Marty McCary and Dr. Atul and Dr. Robert Pearl, where all four of those doctors essentially point out significant problems with physician culture and how it relates to payment for healthcare in that there are aspects of physician culture that absolutely are driving healthcare costs through the roof. But let's examine that because there's been a lot of pushback by physicians and other people in regards to that point of view. Like, look, we're, like, we're doctors. Like, we care for patients. We're not some greedy, money-grubbing scoundrels that you make us out to be. It's unfair of you to say physician culture is as greedy as you say it is. So let's unpack that. Let's look at that. Because I think that those physicians that are pushing back, like, to a certain extent, they have a point. So let's examine that, okay? So, first of all, what is culture? Let's look at a Harvard Business Review article definition of it. It's very good. I'll leave a link to it in the show notes. So culture is the consistent, observable patterns of behavior within an organization. Okay, so here it focuses on behavior. It's what people do. It's consistent. In other words, it's what they repeatedly do. And it's observable, right? So this is, we're talking about objective stuff, right? So there's many different definitions of culture. This is just a Harvard Business Review definition of culture, but I think it's very useful. And of course, who is exhibiting the patterns of behavior is individual people. So we got to talk about the individual people that make up the organizations that are exhibiting this behavior. So in this case, it's physicians. And now I gotta bring up an analogy. So for those of you that subscribe to my newsletter, you see me post a lot of pictures around my farm. So I live on a small farm, okay? And so here you have a beautiful field of wheat. And anyone who's ever driven by a beautiful field of wheat or corn or hay, I mean, it's gorgeous. It's perfectly uniform. The rows are perfectly straight. They're perfectly uh, separated by the same space. The height of the wheat or the corn is all the same. I mean, it's gorgeous, right? I mean, we even write songs about it. Amber waves of grain. Okay, now, you have also probably driven by a field that's filled with weeds, okay? <laughs> to a certain extent, my farm kind of looks like this one. Okay, so again, you could be growing wheat or hay, but there's weeds amongst it, and it really makes the field look bad. A lot of times the weeds stick up higher than the rest of the wheat. They're a different color. They're soaking up nutrients and sunlight that the wheat should be getting. Now notice in this field, the vast majority of it's still wheat. You only have one, two, three, four. You only have six weeds, but the six weeds can make the field look terrible, even though the majority of it is still wheat. So what we really have here with physician culture and the problem of physician, physician quote unquote culture driving high healthcare costs is really a question of wheat versus weeds. And when I'm talking about wheat as far as physicians go, I'm talking about those, it's actually a very straightforward, def, straightforward definition. It's physicians that put the patient first. That's the lens through which they look at their decisions. It's like, what would I do if I put the patient first? And that's what I was taught in medical school and residency. I mean, that's the right thing to do. That's what we should be doing. And then there is versus, okay, well, what, what would be some things other than patients that might be put first? Well, if money is put first, or power is put first, or prestige is put first, or getting promoted is put first, then those things are weeds, right? Because you can absolutely have situations where it actually harms the patient because you've put those other things first and not the patient first. Okay, so that's the definition between wheat and weeds, all right? So, and it's just the classic saying, right? The bad apple spoils the bunch. So you can have a majority of good apples, but if you've got a bad apple, it's gonna spoil the bunch. Likewise, now this is a more crass analogy, but this is a favorite of Charlie Munger's, which is look, if you got a bowl full of raisins and then somebody just puts a few rabbit turds in the bowl of raisins, are you really gonna eat that bowl of raisins? The answer's probably not. It's still majority raisins, but at the end of the day, the rabbits have spoiled the bowl of raisins. Okay, so 
What we have here then, and of course, it's not all good, it's not all bad when it comes to culture, it's on a continuum. So what I've dr drawn here is a continuum of cultures with 100% good here on one side and 100% bad culture here on this side. And here we have, with 100% good culture, you got 100% wheat. There's no bad apples to rot in the bunch. And on this side, you have nothing but bad apples. You got nothing but weeds, where everything is rotten. Now, of course, most organizations are somewhere in the middle. And to a certain extent, which culture dominates? Is it a positive, patient-centric culture? Or is it a negative, money, power, prestige-centric culture? really depends upon, one, who's got the majority, and two, what do the people in positions of power exhibit, right? So, there are specific examples of companies with amazing cultures, and they have taken specific actions to ensure they have as much wheat as humanly possible and as few weeds as possible. Let's go through those examples. First one is Zappos. Of course, of course, before the tragic uh, passing of Tony Shea, Zappos was known for its amazing corporate culture. Now, when they hired employees, they hired for culture in addition to their skills. And they had an ingenious way of measuring whether or not that person was wheat or weeds. And that was, so they had like this campus. The interviewee would come on campus, they'd park their car, and they'd have to get in a shuttle bus to get from their car in the parking lot to the Zappos building. And they actually interviewed, they being the Zappos uh, hiring people, they interviewed the driver of the shuttle and asked him or her, how did that prospective employee treat you? Aha, what an ingenious idea. The person was probably letting down their guard. They were probably more of their natural self when they were on the shuttle. And they might not have been on their best behavior. They might have been in their more accurate behavior. And if they, and, and that's like, oh, it's a shuttle bus driver. That person has no impact on me. Why should I be nice to them? There's nothing that they can do to me. And if they had that type of attitude and they were rude to the shuttle bus driver, the shuttle bus driver would be spoken to by the interviewers at Zappos. And if the shuttle bus driver was like, yeah, this person's a jerk, then like, they wouldn't hire them. If every other interviewer thought it was a fantastic interview, the person was highly competent, they would not hire them, right? So they hired for culture above anything else. And if you didn't pass that culture test with the shuttle bus driver, you failed. Likewise, Southwest Airlines, another organization known for its amazing employee cultures. And I actually worked with Southwest Airlines quite a bit because they were our company's customer. I actually went to, they was invited to go to several events of theirs, and I would speak, uh, et cetera. Now, their HR people, sitting at this round table, their HR people, they're like, look, one of our mantras, they were telling me, one of their mantras at Southwest Airlines is, you hire for attitude, you train for skill. And I was like, whoa, that's so obvious. Right? Because if the person has the skill, but they're a total jerk, they're going to ruin the culture. And you can always teach somebody the skills. You can't always teach somebody to change their attitude. Sometimes you can, but not always. So they were very careful about hiring for the right attitude, for the wheat. And, and you know, at the end of the day, this is really a question of, right, patience first versus the other things. It's really a question of selfishness. Right? We get down to it. like. Okay, what creates bad culture is jerks, and what sort of defines jerks is selfishness. Like, it's not that complicated. Okay, so what's my point here in regards to payment? Fee for service is fertilizer. It's fertilizer for the wheat, but it's also fertilizer for the weeds. In other words, if you're doing more procedures than you need to do, if you're doing more expensive procedures than you need to do, if you're doing things that increase your remuneration and either extract money and extort money from patients and employers, or potentially even harm them because you're doing too much, well, fee-for-service is fantastic fertilizer to make you grow more so the weeds can flourish. Now, there's a ton of wheat that's benefiting from the fertilizer too. And so all the wheat cries out, don't take away our fertilizer, don't take away our fee for service, we need it to grow. And that's true. And they're not taking advantage of the fertilizer. They're not taking advantage of the fee for service. And the majority of the field looks like this. And so anytime there's a criticism of physician culture, all the wheat cries out and it's like, look, we're not scoundrels. We're not taking advantage of this. But 
they don't say anything about the weeds, okay? So, listen, I talk a lot about getting rid of fee-for-service and going to capitation or value-based payments or prepaid carrier call. Okay, fine. I'll let you have your fee-for-service. We don't have to change from fee-for-service. Let's keep fee-for-service, but under one condition, we have aggressive weed control. What is that? What is that is transparency. We gotta be able to see the weeds what we are so that patients can just steer away from them, employers can steer away from them. So we need to have the utmost transparency so we can see the weeds so we know what we're dealing with. Two, there needs to be more self-policing of physicians. So fine, physicians, you want this? Hey, the medical boards themselves or the physician practices or whatever, you gotta get rid of the bad apples. You gotta get rid of the weeds. That was one of the prime examples in the Netflix series, The Pharmacist, where that Dr. Claggett, who was running an Oxycontin pill mill in New Orleans, like the Louisiana boss, medical board wouldn't get rid of her. Like he was one of the most egregious abuses of her physician prescribing privileges. And, the phys and they, they did, there's so many things that the physician, that, that the board could have, the medical board of Louisiana could have gone after her about, and they didn't. And there's so many less egregious things that arguably, whether it's the medical board or the hospital, you know, whoever, physician practice, like you got, you got to do something about weed control. Likewise, what's another thing you can do for weed control? You can just pull out the weeds, okay? How do you pull out the weeds? Well, we kind of have that with the Office of the Inspector General within the Department of Health and Human Services where they go and they search out and investigate fraud, waste, and abuse. And arguably, what if you made the OIG 10 times bigger? What if employers were like, listen, we don't rely on the carriers anymore to do fraud, waste, and abuse. We're going to do it ourselves, and we're going to have our own private investigators get in there and pull out the weeds because, frankly, our carriers are not doing a good job of pulling out the weeds. What if we did that, right? So... Listen, you want fee for service? Fine, you can have it, but let's do some weed control. And that's my point for today. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Scene.